A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 to 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And may God speak to us through these verses today. You know, a lot of times when I'm watching TV, I see a lot of advertisements for what they call like those before and after advertisements. Maybe it's one of those that shows someone who's lost a lot of weight, had an extreme makeover of some kind. The ad highlights a dramatic change in the person's appearance. Now they're happy. They'll have plenty of people attracted to them, right? Now, of course, that's because we live in a very image-conscious society where people are judged quite a bit on their looks, And really, the message of all these weight loss ads and makeover programs is that you can improve your life by changing your appearance, your outer self. Well, maybe you can. But that kind of life improvement does kind of reflect some superficial values. If our happiness and our self-worth are based on looks, they're not really real and they won't bring lasting happiness. And no amount of weight loss or plastic surgery or makeovers can change that. Now, changing who we are on the outside is really not as important as changing who we are on the inside. That's one of the basic principles of our faith. No matter who we are, where we come from, how much money we have, whether we're male or female, young or old, any of us can change. Take a look at Saul, also known more famously as Paul, from our scripture reading. He was a strict Pharisee, and he was making a name for himself as a vicious enemy of this new Jesus movement that in scripture was sometimes called the way which we call Christianity. Paul has just come from Jerusalem. And if you read earlier in the book of Acts, he's just come from supporting the stoning to death of a Christian named Stephen. Now he's on his way to Damascus to round up more Christians and drag them back in chains. But who would guess 
that something was about to happen that would change Paul so drastically that he'd be preaching Jesus on the street corners and he would become the first great Christian missionary. Talk about an extreme makeover. Now, before his conversion, Paul saw himself as a faithful defender of his faith. He saw himself as a good guy. And he believed that he was doing the right thing when he tried to help stamp out Christianity, even if it meant using extreme and awful methods like violence. Frankly, how often it happens that the most terrible things in this world are done by people who believe they're doing the right thing in the name of some imagined greater good. That's why we have terrorist bombings and holy wars. That's why Christians sometimes do the same awful things that were once done to them, persecution, imprisonment, and killing. But with Paul, something happened that opened his eyes. Although, ironically, his eyes were opened when he went blind. Blinded, he says, by a divine light, a vision of Jesus. And this becomes the pivotal moment in Paul's life. It is the turning point that marked his before and after. And Paul is so overwhelmed by this experience, he's taken into the city and cared for by a Christian named Ananias. And he spends a few days with some other Christians. He's even baptized. And then he begins his mission to the world. But it would not be an easy mission because first, Paul had a nasty reputation to overcome. Everyone would be suspicious. Was this just some new trick? Maybe it would be difficult for people to take him seriously or for them to overcome their prejudice against Paul. Ananias has doubts and misgivings about Paul. He knows his reputation. Lord, he says, I've heard about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. But Jesus assures Ananias that Paul has changed and that he has been chosen for greater things. So Ananias now calls Paul brother. He accepts and trusts Paul. But Paul still has to struggle to gain trust and respect among the other Christians, especially their leaders, James and Peter. And another problem that Paul faced was that the religious authorities he had been working for would now be after him. He had placed himself on his own enemies list, and he would make new enemies in the Roman Empire. This is why he kept, if you read through his letters, he kept running, running for his life. He wound up in jail a few times. Now, Scripture never tells us what ultimately happened to Paul. There are sources that say that he was martyred in Rome eventually. But between his rebirth in Christ and his death, he put Christianity as we know it on the map. Now, there are many people who can point to one moment when they say they found Jesus, what's often called the born-again experience. Some people can describe it in great detail. They can tell you the time, the place, what they were wearing, and so on. Paul obviously can. But his story and similar dramatic conversions, frankly, are not the norm. They're out of the ordinary. We shouldn't use them to measure anyone's faith. Because for others, a conversion experience is more more like a long series of fits and starts. You know, there are some people, they're baptized as infants. They're raised in a church. They gradually grow into their beliefs. Their conversion is sort of something that goes on day by day as they go through new experiences, and it's not finished yet. That's been my own experience, and it's the same for many others. 
There's a minister who tells the story of a man who was baptized when he was 63 after having been a churchgoer for many years. And people wanted to know, well, why did you wait so long? He says, it took me this long to know. And I think what he meant is that sometimes it takes a while, a long while, for us to really get what all this is or is supposed to be. Then there are some people who were also baptized as infants. They were raised in churches. They can talk scripture and they can say the prayers and sing the hymns. But they never seem to hear that call from Christ. Or they hear it, but they don't answer it. And they don't really let him in. You know, in a lot of ways, the story of Paul's conversion is a lesson for any of us who think that we already have full understanding, full belief, perfect conversion. Those of us who may think we already know everything there is to know and we know exactly what God wants. That's what Paul thought when he was hunting down Christians. That's even a little of what Ananias thought when he had trouble accepting that Paul had changed. And that's certainly what Christians think when they do terrible things in the name of Christ. As one writer says, conversion is not only for the unsaved. The truth is, we are all in need of conversion now and then. Someone once said that sometimes we are the ones standing in God's way, even those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus. Even with the best intentions, we can oppose the way of Christ. And so we must ask ourselves, are we open to what God is doing in us and around us? Even if it's not what we're used to, if it doesn't make much sense to us, we may not even like it. Are we always on the right path? Are we turning more and more to Jesus Christ each day? Now, I think some of this is particularly appropriate as we address new members joining our church today and a baptism today. Because the bottom line is, each one of us must ask ourselves, okay, I'm a church-going Christian, but have I really encountered Christ? Have I been converted not to the Christian faith, not to the Presbyterian church, but to Christ, to the way of Christ? Have I let Christ into my heart and my life? Now, Paul can tell us a lot about conversion. So if we're looking for an answer to that question about ourselves, we might want to study his example. And one of the most important things we learn from Paul is that conversion, being saved or born again or whatever we want to call it, it is not the end of our journey. It's not a goal line that you cross and there you are. It is the beginning of our journey. I think a lot of people believe that accepting Jesus is sort of just like, well, I'm baptized and I belong to a church and I can just coast. Or it's like the day we buy some insurance and we sit back and relax. We're provided for. Paul never saw it that way. Paul saw it as a kind of rebirth, the beginning of a new and very different life. Someone said it is the lasting mark of conversion is not a date circled in red on a calendar, but it is the whole story of a person's life. In the end, Paul's dramatic conversion, we only tell his story. It's only worth telling because of what he did afterwards. And that really is true for all of us. In the end, the only real measure or meaning of finding new life in Christ is what we do with it. Amen.